Good afternoon and welcome to the 7th Annual Heart Failure Community Fair. My, my name is Donna Keir and I am the manager here at Maui Memorial Medical Center for the Education Department. I have the pleasure today of being your moderator and will see you through this virtual event. If you have questions, please go to We Are Maui Health Facebook, share those questions with us, and when we have completed our speakers' presentations, we will try to address as many of those questions as possible in the time that we have left. Together, we will have the opportunity to learn from heart experts as they share not only important information, but tips to keep our heart in shape. We are pleased to have as our guests today, Leslie Lexier, Dr. Parikh, Dr. Kimball Poon, Nicole Dusenberry, and Dr. Patel. And to help us start off, our fair today, I would like to introduce a friend and colleague, Leslie Lexier. This past year, in October of 2021, Maui Health was invited to participate in a national panel of excellence in heart failure care sponsored by the American Heart Association. Leslie, who is a quality analyst here at Maui Memorial, along with Dr. Kuhn, had the opportunity to represent our hospital's great work and speak to the care given to ensure that our heart failure patients receive award-winning care. Leslie? Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our seventh annual Community Heart Failure Fair. Donna, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. So we're really excited to be honoring you today and presenting this wonderful educational experience. Uh, we're award-winning here, and this is a very appropriate time for us to be holding this educational event because next week is Heart Failure Awareness Week. So we um, participate in a program that is called Get With The Guidelines. It is a quality initiative program and is sponsored by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. We do so well with our quality measures that we are award winning. And you will see up on the screen shortly our awards that we have received. And we've received these awards for many, many years now. Uh, we receive the top level of the award, the Honor Roll Award, as well as an award for the diabetes care that we give to our heart failure patients. So why is this care important that we give? Well, you know we're going to get better outcomes for our patients when evidence-based care is practiced. And how does this evidence-based care come about? Well, guidelines are created. The guidelines are created by the American Heart Association. They take into account the experience and expertise of physicians, such as the experts you're going to hear from today. The American Heart Association also does a great deal of research and studies. As well, they ask the heart fa fa failure patients themselves, hey, what works for you? What are your preferences? What are your values? What are your likes and what are your dislikes? And all of this comprise evidence-based care. When you enter our hospital and are a patient for heart failure, we're going to provide a great deal of education. We're going to talk about diet with you and any dietary restrictions. We're going to talk about your medications and any side effects to look out for. We're going to instruct you about tests that you may be having to uh, in undergo. Uh, we'll be talking about weight monitoring. We'll be talking about activity levels and what to do if you experience some symptoms and worsening of your symptoms. We're very proud and we lead the nation in offering our patients one-on-one -on -one education. A minimum of 60 minutes is offered to our patients. Um, as well, prior to the patients going home, we make sure that a follow-up discharge appointment is in place. And if we can't do that, let's say if it's a weekend or an evening, we will call our patients 72 hours after they go home and ask them how they're doing and whether or not they're set up for their follow-up appointment. So why is education important? And why is follow-up appointments? Why are they important? Well, it actually decreases readmissions to the hospital. 
that means our patients can stay home with their families and their loved ones in a comfortable environment. Education and follow-up appointments also decrease mortality. It decreases deaths. So this is the evidence-based care that we provide for our patients. And because of our award-winning care, you will see us in the U.S. News and World Report magazine as one of the best hospitals in the nation. And not only are we recognized for the care that we give for our heart failure patients, but also for our stroke patients as well. So again, evidence-based care is really important to provide patient um, positive outcomes. And uh, we're very honored uh, to be offering this to our community that we live in and that we love. And thank you so much for attending today's event. And I hope you learn a lot. And thank you so much, Donna. Thank you, Leslie. Leslie is not only an advocate here at Maui Health for our heart failure patients, but in the community. I have had the opportunity to work with Leslie side by side at community events and at health fairs, women's events, and she is always an advocate for our entire community for heart failure. Thank you, Leslie. Our next presenter is Dr. Jay Parikh. He is a cardiologist for Kaiser Permanente Hawaii. He attended New York University and medical school at New York Medical College. Dr. Parikh and I share my alma mater. He attended Oregon Health Sciences University, where he com completed his medical residency. At Oregon Health Sciences, he also completed his fellowship in cardiology. Please help me uh, to welcome Dr. Parikh as he shares with us how your heart works and how to care for it. Donna, thank you again for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's really my pleasure today to uh, talk to you about heart failure and uh, how you could manage this condition if you're given this diagnosis. So essentially, we're going to start with the death where there's just too much fluid in the body. Um, and this can be because you've been given a diagnosis of an, of a an heart abnormality, such as a valve problem or a weakness of the heart muscle. But it could also be because you have high blood pressure, diabetes, or some sort of problem with the kidneys. So um, it does not have to be from the heart directly, but the, the disease state that we call heart failure includes a lot of different disorders, including those of the heart. And you know, you, you play a pretty central role in how you feel through this disorder. You also have a, a major part in how long you live, and um, we're going to get to some of those topics later. So let's start with this, um, this important point of you've gotten this diagnosis of heart failure. Now what do you do to empower yourself and monitor yourself going forward? So first, let's start with symptoms. Um, there are some symptoms to recognize and to pay attention to. The more of these symptoms you have, the more likely it is that you're having a worsening of heart failure if you have this diagnosis. So the symptoms that I think are pretty classic are shortness of breath. So, you know, normal activities such as doing chores in the house, walking upstairs. If you're noticing an increase in shortness of breath, that's concerning. Um, if you have increased swelling, that of the belly or the legs or even potentially the hands, then that could suggest that you have a worsening in heart failure. It could also be from uh, the things that can be concerning. The additional things could be, um, you know, an increase in shortness of breath at night. So maybe you need more pillows to sleep, or maybe it's so bad that you need to sleep upright in a recliner. And to a lesser extent, sometimes people can get dizzy when bending over or doing activities. Uh, you may also feel like your heart's racing all the time. So once again, if you have a diagnosis of heart failure, these are the classic symptoms to monitor for. The other strategy I recommend is weighing yourself every day. So, you know, the key to data is to make sure that it's consistent and accurate. How do you do that at home? Well, one of the easiest ways is to step on a scale first thing in the morning. Um, you know, at that time, you know, you would void your bladder, you just make sure that all the conditions are the same every morning, and you know, you'd have minimal clothes before you step in the shower. So that, I think, is an ideal time. You step on the scale, you write down 
your weight, and you can track that over time. What to look for, though? So you have all these weights, now what do you do with that? If you've gained more than two to three pounds in a day, or you've noticed that you've gained more than five pounds in a week, it's unlikely to be that you know, you're just not eating well and you've gained a lot of fat. That would be a little bit too quick for water by itself. So uh, you know, if you have this type of weight gain, it may be important to contact us, let us know. There may already be a strategy in place for you to take maybe an additional pill of one of your medications or other adjustments in your medications based on this kind of data. And then the kind of um, uh, findings that you may have on exam, well, one thing that you can monitor for is swelling in the legs. And that comes in the form of this type of spongy, compressible um, you know, edema, we call it, which just means it's a fancy word for saying there's water in your legs. And since water flows with gravity, it's going to go to the lowest parts of your body. And that would include your feet, your ankles, you know, your legs, um, and potentially if you have so much fluid, it can even enter the belly and, and higher up. So this is an easy thing to, to follow. And if you notice that you're having more of this, you're having a deeper compression in, in these little indentations, then that may suggest that you're retaining more water. Uh, vice versa, if you have an improvement and your legs look nice and skinny, you can see your ankles, that may show that we're making progress. And if you notice that any of these symptoms are worse, or if your exam findings are worse, or your weight's going up, it's really important to stay in touch with either your cardiologist, if you have one, or your primary care doctor. A lot of these, um, a lot of these issues uh, happen gradually, and the earlier we know about them, the more we can be proactive so that you can stay out of the hospital and you can feel better. So a major pillar in management of heart failure is also diet. And it's really important to address what we put into our bodies. Specifically in heart failure, it regards uh, to sodium. And sodium is important because it is a, a very strong uh, force that brings water into the bodies. When you have this condition, heart failure, the kidneys work differently. And they work over time to keep salt in your body. That salt then brings water into the rest of your body and it can bring water into your tissues, but also your lungs, and that's where people get short of breath. So what kinds of numbers are we looking for? You know, reducing salt is pretty common sense, but what number should we aim for? And that would be less than two grams or 2,000 milligrams a day. Now, some people will say 1,500 milligrams, and that's a little bit more aggressive, but it really depends on how you're doing in this condition. If you're doing really poorly, then we may reduce it further. So, it's difficult to find the right foods. Uh, I acknowledge that. If you go into a supermarket, the vast majority of the foods are processed. And processed foods, while you can't avoid all of them, there are some major culprits that I think are worth avoiding. So, you know, for example, one cup of ramen will have more than half of the daily recommended total we have for heart failure patients. If you have a slice of Spam, that's more than a quarter. If you have the whole can, you're well beyond what we would recommend for the whole day. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's a frame of reference. And then restaurants and fast foods are quite dicey. And the reason why is because salt is a great food preservative, but it's also a taste enhancer. And you know the restaurant industry, food in fast food industry, um, this is part of their business model. And so it's a little bit hard to estimate how much salt you're getting in these items, so I would recommend minimizing them. It's hard to beat 100% off of fast foods, but I would recommend minimizing them. And the last major pillar in heart failure is medications. So we have multiple classes of heart failure medications. There are actually some newer medications that I did not include in this, tab, in this table, but these are probably the four major classes of heart failure medications. And they are beta blockers, water pills, uh, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, and aldosterone antagonists. That's a handful, but you know, some common names that you might come across are metoprolol, ferrosamide, spironolactone, lisinopril. These are common medications that we use for other conditions as well. So just something to keep in mind that if you have heart failure, you may be on multiple medications, and that's all part, of, part by design. They all work differently on the heart to get you feeling better. And, you know, I want to give you a series of tips before I end my, my segment. Um, one is pillboxes are your friend. And the reason is because life is complicated. There's a lot of things that come up. And it's really hard to look back and remember exactly what you took 
uh, in terms of medications, especially when you just have a bottle full of pills and it's really hard to know whether, you know, to fact check whether you took it or not. So pill boxes are great. It just keeps things organized and you can know that you're reliably taking the medications. Then secondly, I would say that if cost is an issue, um, I would recommend that you reach out to medication assistance programs. And so I know Kaiser has it, but HMSA and other organizations do have something equivalent. And that's really important because that will prevent you from having to stop your medications because of cost. We don't want that to happen. Um, third, I would say that if you don't know your medications by heart, bring them to you know, our, your appointments because it is, a lot of the, the medications, they have different shapes and sizes for the same doses depending on the manufacturer. So it's really hard for us to tell just based on shape, color, or size alone. Bringing the bottles helps us understand what you're taking, helps you understand what you should be doing. And then lastly, not taking medications on schedule or missing doses, which is worse, may actually worsen your heart failure. Um, there may be some withdrawal from your body from the medications. That's not as much of an issue as really not getting the treatment you need to live longer and to stay healthier. And so in this last slide, I, I wanna show that really this is why all of us wake up every morning and we come to work, is to make sure that you, know, you live as long and healthy life as possible and heart failure is just one of those conditions that we can manage with you and ensure that you have a happy life. And so with that, I'm going to finish and I'm gonna give this back to Donna. Thank you, Dr. Parikh. For those of us who have family members with heart failure or if you're joining us because you want to know about the heart failure you're experiencing, those are great things that we can incorporate day to day that can make a difference for all of us and things that we can support each other on to help make us just feel better. Our next guest speaker is Nicole Dusenberry. Nicole is a physician assistant with Kaiser Permanente Hawaii. She received her training at Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York, and is as a certified physician's assistant. Today, Nicole is going to be sharing her expertise on exercise and cardiac rehabilitation. Nicole. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you for having me here to talk with you today. Now, I know a lot of you are seeing the word exercise and you are probably turning down your hearing aids or rolling your eyes at home. I know it's happening even if I can't see you, but it really truly is an important piece of not only your heart failure therapy, but your overall health. Okay, now we're in business. So the benefits of physical activity are not just for heart failure. The overall risk for mortality or death is reduced by 30% just by getting regular physical activity. Heart disease is reduced by 35%. It can even reduce your risk of dementia, falls or hip fractures, things that keep you from being able to live at home independently, which is also important as we age. The regular physical activity will help improve your sleep quality, your cognition. Of course, it helps things like cholesterol and sugars, which are also very helpful uh, in terms of heart failure. It will improve your stability and balance to reduce the risk of falls and other complications. So the American Heart Association recommends that you get at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity. So to define these, moderate activity would be anything that is getting your heart rate up and you're breathing harder than normal, but you can still talk in sentences. Vigorous activity is working hard enough that it's difficult to speak in full sentences and that you're starting to break a sweat. So you can do moderate activity and still walk and gossip, but if you are not able to carry on your conversation, then it may be considered vigorous. The other important thing to know is that all of the activity does not have to be done together. So you could do 10 minute interval walks three times a day. You could get 150 minutes in one day of the week or you could break it up over the course of five days. So the total is the important piece, getting up and moving. And so you can find a way to work it into your everyday life. 
So the effects of heart failure on your exercise tolerance is that when the heart is not pumping efficiently, you're not getting good oxygen saturation to your tissues, such as your muscle and your brain, and you're going to get tired quickly. You're gonna run out of gas. When you're just sitting and resting, you may feel your heart beating a little bit faster. That's a sign that you're not necessarily in great cardiovascular health. It can also lead to things like vascular dysfunction, meaning that your arteries are clenching down, they're not dilating nicely, so it makes your blood pressure much harder to control. It also impacts your kidney function. And it will also increase systemic inflammation, which means higher risk for heart attack, stroke, even things like your arthritis can be worse with higher levels of inflammation. And so the impact of doing exercise to reverse these problems, you'll improve the amount of blood your heart is pumping out. So better cardiac output, better oxygen saturation to all of your body, not only during activity, but even at rest. When you're sitting and resting, your resting heart rate is going to be lower if you are in better cardiovascular shape. It also is gonna help control your blood pressure. It will decrease the inflammation, decreasing your hospitalization risk as well as stroke and heart attack risk. So there are different types of exercises that you can do at home. There are also things that we would consider part of cardiac rehab programs. So if you were just admitted for heart failure or a heart attack, then we may have a more regimented program or structure that we want you to follow. And so here on Maui, we're very lucky that the HUI has a wonderful Ornish program uh, that you can enroll in that will help you with a lot of different aspects of heart failure management. So supervised exercise, there's diet control uh, and coaching. There is a lot of group support and classes that you can attend, so those are very helpful. We also have, uh, I know within Kaiser, we have our own lifestyle programs and can enroll you with health and lifestyle coaches. I'm sure HMSA and the others on, on Maui have opportunities as well. So it doesn't always require you to go somewhere to have that uh, advanced uh, care. So some of the other community exercise programs that you can take part in, uh, you'll see those on the screen here. Things like silver sneakers, uh, enhanced fitness, some of the local pools have scheduled water aerobics that are great for those of you that may have joint or back problems. I hear that a lot. I would love to exercise, but my knees prevent me from, or my hips prevent me from doing them. Getting in the pool is a great way to do that. It takes the weight off of those joints and allows you to move more freely. You can also do home-based programs. Today's vid uh, video and digital age has made it actually very simple to find classes online. And you can do that through the AHA website, YouTube, uh, be careful what you're searching for there. Um, some of the programs can be designed with your providers in mind and you could write down a regimented program that you could just stick to the fridge and follow at home. There's different categories of exercise, and it's good to mix and match these. So you don't necessarily wanna do the same exercise every day. Your muscles and heart do best when you have some variety. So brisk walking is a great way to go out and exercise in your neighborhood. You could do it in your backyard. You could do it down at the stadium. Do it with your uh, aunties or uncles while you're gossiping in the mall. Uh, but it is a, a great way to get in the exercise that doesn't cost you anything and is easy to do. Other exercises, things like tennis, if you're able to do that, lifting weights, even if it's a low weight, it actually can be very helpful. Um, doing calisthenics or stretching, yoga, of course, is great for a lot of things, not only your cardiovascular health, but your mental health as well. Uh, things like Tai Chi, also great for your balance. And again, talking about these mobility issues, water aerobics and swimming are a great way for those of you that may have mobility issues because of other medical conditions. 
resistance training with resistance bands or something that you can use in your home, easy to get and, and relatively inexpensive. You could do seated exercises. You don't even have to get out of the chair. You can sit and do leg lifts. You could do sit to stand exercises. Those kinds of things uh, can be done easily and in, in, in the comfort of your own home. Uh, so you don't have to worry about if you're sweating in front of people or, or anything embarrassing like that. But small dumbbells, wrist or ankle weights, those things are simple to have in the home. Don't take up a lot of space and can be really helpful also. So we often get asked about what is the target heart rate? Uh, so different conditions such as arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, people that have pacemakers often will ask me about heart rates and targets because they're worried, will I do too much? Can I cause any damage? And you can see here, this is just an approximation of what the target heart rates or max heart rates would be over the course of your lifetime. And you can see as you age, that target heart rate range is gonna be lower. You don't have to get your heart rate up to 180 if you're 65 years old. So, you know, we can adjust that based on what your age and, and physical condition are. And to be uh, open to the idea also that your medications may very well affect what your heart rates will be during exercise. So for example, a lot of these will look familiar. Dr. Parikh just uh, spoke about them. Things like your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or antiarrhythmics will slow the heart rate down. So you may work very hard and be breaking that sweat, but you notice that your heart rate is going to hit a cap and it's not going to go any further. Uh, so uh, don't worry about obsessing about the target heart rate or how long it's there. The main thing is, you know, we can talk about what is safe for you individually, but know that these medications may play a part in how high it may go. Um, the other medications that are common for heart failure that will not impact your heart rate would be ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs like Losartan or your diuretics. So in summary, talk to your providers about your options and your plan. You want to start low and slow, do what you can, and build up over time. And even if it takes you six months to build up to your maximum, that's fine. It's better to start in a low range and be safe and increase it when you're able. And maybe it means just walking an extra five minutes the next week or adding five more pounds the next week. That's how you'll get increases over time that are safe and will benefit you. You want to monitor your blood pressure and heart rate if possible. Things like Apple Watches or Fitbits have made it really simple. Even a simple pedometer can be very helpful. Most of our phones now have some type of help, health app that can help track those things too. And that can help you and your providers decide if you are doing too much, maybe not enough, and we can adjust from there. But remember, you should always stop exercising if you develop chest pain, severe shortness of breath, lightheadedness, or if you feel weakness. And then you should track your progress. That way it helps keep you on track if you are improving as you expect to be. And if you can make it a contest with maybe your family members or your neighbor, uh, just to keep each other motivated. Because I know some days it's just hard to get yourself off the couch. So here are a couple of little jokes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now, seriously, what can we do to improve our health as he's listing exercise eight times? But the truth is most people don't want to be on a ton of medications for their whole lives. Exercise is one of the best things that you can do to try to improve your heart health and your overall health. If you want to avoid being on medications that may not be necessary, exercise is a great way to address those problems. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I know everybody is ready to put their tennis shoes on and go for it. Here at Maui Health, one of the things do, we do is support each other on uh, things like exercise and getting our steps in, and we do have a little bit of competition that helps us keep our energy going. So you can all be very, very creative in how you can help get those steps in and support each other to get the exercise in. Again, if you have questions, please remember that if you go on to We Are Maui Health Facebook and you type in your questions, we will do our best to help address those questions after our presenters have uh, presented their uh, 
expertise. Pacemakers and defibrillators will be presented by Dr. Kimball Poon. Dr. Poon is a graduate of Harvard University. He attended Cornell University Medical School in New York and completed his residency at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Poon continued his education in cardiology fellowships at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and Kaiser Los Angeles Medical Center. Dr. Poon is published and presents his cardiology specialty at education forums such as ours today. And as an educator here at Maui Memorial, I greatly appreciate the time he gives to not only support our programs, but staff out there who are caring for patients should they have a question. So in support of all of our cardiology patients and us who need this information, thanks, Dr. Poon. Good afternoon. All right. So pacemakers are some of the most sophisticated devices ever invented. It is really amazing that something so small can be so intelligent and impactful. But at the same time, that can make them mysterious and scary. So in the next 10 minutes, I'll explain how pacemakers work and dispel some common misperceptions. If you ever need or you already have a pacemaker, this information will reassure you and empower you to live life to its fullest. This is what we'll cover. Number one, the different parts of a pacemaker system. Number two, how it helps patients with heart failure, some common misconceptions, and a brief history of pacemaker development. But first, we're going to start off with a quiz to assess your baseline knowledge. Question one, how big is a pacemaker? Is it 12 cubic centimeters, which is about the size of a watch? Is it 80 cubic centimeters, which is the size of the iPhone X? Or is it 100 cubic centimeters, which is the size of the standard Vegas playing deck? Question two, can patients with a pacemaker use a microwave? And question three, which historical event stimulated pacemaker development? Was it the Great Depression of the 30s, World War II in the 40s, or the Internet of the 90s? So think about the, the questions, and then we'll get back to the answers at the end. The job of a pacemaker is to keep the heart rate from going too slow. So a pacemaker system has two parts. There's the pulse generator and the leads. So on the upper right side of the picture is the pulse generator, and it contains the battery and a computer in a hermetically sealed titanium container. And there are one to three leads, which are wires that carry the electrical impulses from the computer down to the heart. And if the computer detects that the heart rate falls below the program rate, which we usually set around 50 or 60 beats per minute, the pulse generator sends the impulse through the leads to stimulate the heart muscle. So the first question most patients ask when I tell them about a pacemaker is, how big is it? So pacemakers are surprisingly small. They're about 12 to 15 cubic centimeters in volume, and they can easily fit in the palm of your hand. Pacemakers help patients who have slow heart rates. So we know about 10% of patients with heart failure eventually need a pacemaker. So how do you know if you need a pacemaker? Well, there are three main symptoms that may indicate that a need for a pacemaker. So first, there's fainting. Uh, there's also getting tired easily with activity or dizziness, which is the feeling of an impending faint. So most pacemakers are implanted to treat a slow heart rate, which in called bradycardia. So at rest, the heart rate usually beats around 50 to 70 times each minute, and with exercise, the heart rate may increase two to threefold. But if the heart beats too slowly, the brain and the body don't get enough blood flow, and these symptoms may emerge. And so a slow heart rate is usually the result of age-related changes or by a disease that has damaged the heart muscle, like a heart attack. The patient experience really has two phases. There's a surgery and the follow-up. So during the pacemaker surgery, we make an incision, usually below the left collarbone, and the pulse generator fits underneath the skin on top of the muscle. And most patients go home the same day. Discomfort lasts about a week. And then for follow-up, we check the device every three to six months. And so what are we looking for? There are really two things. 
Number one, we want to assess the pacemaker function in the battery life. We can tell exactly how many years are left on the battery and if there are any problems with the pacemaker system. And number two, we're looking for irregular heart rhythms. It's amazing, but your heart will beat 30 million times a year, and the pacemaker records any significant rhythm abnormality. So there are a lot of misconceptions about pacemakers, and please do not be shy about asking questions. There really are no dumb questions. We are about to screw a wire into your heart muscle permanently. It is critical that you understand the procedure and the implications for your quality of life. So let's review the three most common concerns that I hear. So the first one is, with my pacemaker, I cannot use a microwave oven. Now this was true for very old pacemakers, but it is not true of contemporary models. So appliances like microwaves can create magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields can interfere with pacemaker function. But the current contemporary devices all have sophisticated shielding to prevent interference. People with pacemaker, pacemakers may use all types of household appliances and power tools. Otherwise, it would be millions of people fated to drink stale, cold coffee. That's pretty terrible. Oops, okay. Number two. With my pacemaker, I cannot travel. So this concern really has two parts. So first, is it safe for me to be away from home? And what happens if something happens to my pacemaker? And the second is, will the security screening process impact my device? So for the first part, Patients can have their device evaluated anywhere around the world. A cardiology office in Spain can check a pacemaker implanted in Vietnam, and cardiology nerds like myself speak this universal language. And then for the second part, security checks are extremely unlikely to cause a problem. The full body scanners will not affect a pacemaker, and the wand checks, if done correctly, also are very safe. Ah, this is one of my favorite. So, with my pacemaker, someone can hack into it and make me sick. So in 2011, Showtime had this incredible series called Homeland, featuring Claire Danes and Damian Lewis. I mean, great plot, involving CIA and an ex-Marine that gets converted to a terrorist. So I'm going to stop here because I don't want to spoil the end, and really I could go on and on. Anyway, in the 10th episode of season 2, the main terrorist hacks into the pacemaker of the vice president and kills the VP by delivering a shock through the pacemaker. So after this show, many patients ask me about the plausibility of this scenario. This is simply not possible. A hacker could potentially gain access to diagnostic data. They could find out how much battery life you have, but a hacker cannot reprogram the device. So let's wrap up with real, genuine history and not TV drama, although I need to reiterate Homeland is really, really good. The story of most inventions begins with a problem to be solved. So in this case, people were just passing out. So as I described earlier, if the heart rate is too slow, insufficient blood reaches the brain and then causes a faint. So in the 1820s, there were two Irish physicians, William Stokes and Robert Adams, described patients with a slow pulse with fainting fits. So in medical parlance, this is the Stokes-Adams attack or Stokes-Adams seizure. So this is the problem. So for centuries, scientists and religious leaders considered the heart to be too sacred for any manipulation. And modern cardiology and cardiac surgery begins during World War II. So innovative, fearless cardiac surgeons shattered this inertia when they began operating on wounded soldiers. So the earliest surgeries involved removing shrapnel from the heart. But within a decade, surgeons were closing congenital defects, so those are holes that you're born with, and using bypass machines. Pioneers like Harkin, Lilyhigh, Sinning, all of us in this room really stand on their shoulders. Now, one of the most common complications of cardiac surgery was collateral damage to the heart's own electrical system. So in other words, in the process of fixing a major structural problem, like closing a hole, the surgeons would damage the electrical system, causing profoundly slow heart rates and these Stokes-Adams attack. So the obvious step was how to stimulate the heart, but what's the best way to do it? 
So in a nutshell, this is the evolution of the pacemaker. We are going to go from external wires and external power source and end up at internal wires and internal power source. So this is a picture of Paul Zoll, who's a really famous Boston cardiologist, demonstrating one of the earliest versions of a pacemaker. So it's a leather strap and there are these metal electrodes um, attached to it. And the jolt of electricity stimulates the heart, but it also causes all the muscles of the chest to contract. And this was extremely painful, and at least one patient committed suicide by turning the thing off. Later, Seymour Furman modified the system to use a transvenous lead where it enters in through his arm. So in this situation, the wire is attached directly to the heart muscle, so the pulses of electricity do not stimulate the chest muscle. And the device, shaped like a microwave that's sitting on the cart, is the external power source. So the nurses would run up and down the hallway, moving the plug to each different power source. Of course, there's some limitations to that when the patients are going up down the stairs. So this patient used the pacemaker for a total of 96 days until his own electrical system recovered. And finally, this is the Medtronic 5850, which is one of the earliest fully internal pacemakers. So the surgeons would attach the wires to the heart surface and then implant the power source under the skin. So after 10 to 12 years now, the battery runs out and we need to change the battery pack. Now, this happens every single month. Some patient tries to pull a Jerry Seinfeld and says, aha, gee, too bad, no one thought of a nuclear pacemaker, ha ha ha. Well, in fact, this was tried. There were about 3,000 patients that received a nuclear-powered pacemaker using plutonium. Now, this sounds absolutely bananas, but in the 1960s, the state-of-the-art pacemaker battery was really bad, and it only lasted a few months. And at the same time, this was when nuclear energy and enthusiasm was really at its peak. We really didn't have the disasters of the Three Mile Island and the Chernobyl. But, and this is a big but, plutonium is one of the most toxic elements on the face of the earth. What if a patient gets into a car accident or a plane crash or even just gets cremated? So fortunately, at this time, scientists developed very reliable lithium batteries and thus a safer, more attractive alternative to nuclear energy was devised. <laughs> okay, wrapping up here, let's go back to our three quiz questions. Number one, how big is a pacemaker? Hopefully you paid attention, it's 12 cc's, about the size of a watch. Number two, can patients with a pacemaker use a microwave? Definitely they can. And number three, which historical event stimulated pacemaker development? And really it's World War II. All cardiology and cardiac surgery really is born in this period. So in summary, pacemakers are an amazing technology. They are small and powerful, and patients can have a great quality of life. Pacemakers help patients who have fainting or dizziness, and patients have a long track record of safety and reliability. And yes, for all you Jerry Seinfelds out there, nuclear pacemakers have been tried, but they just didn't pan out. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you can shoot us an email here, or you can send us questions via Facebook. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Poon. That was not only great information, but I loved the history part. It was great. Uh, Dr. Uh, Patel is our next presenter, and he is a cardiologist with Pacific Permanente Group Hawaii. He is a graduate of the Medical College of Virginia and completed his postdoctoral at Emory University and University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Patel is also published. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for sharing your expertise with us today on cardiac catheterization. Thank you, Donna, for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Poon, for discussing pacemakers. I have a tough act to follow, so hopefully uh, I'll keep your attention uh, through the rest of this presentation. So within the field of cardiology, there are cardiologists, and within that, there are subspecialist cardiologists. <clears throat> so if you think of Dr. Poon as the electrician of cardiology, you can think of me as a plumber of cardiology. So today we'll be talking about cardiac catheterizations and angiograms. Before we get to the actual procedure itself, what are we looking for with a heart catheterization or angiogram? And what we're looking for is coronary artery disease. So you've probably heard this, coronary artery disease or CAD. Well, what is it? 
coronary artery disease is the cholesterol plaque buildup in the heart arteries. And there's several risk factors for developing this. One of the biggest risk factors is our diet. Uh, unhealthy diet, eating fast food, fried food, high cholesterol foods can contribute to this. Obesity and smoking. The toxins in cigarettes and cigars have direct effects on the lining of the heart muscle as well as the lining of the heart arteries, causing development of plaque. Family history, and of course, the three mainstays, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and diabetes. So what does a heart artery look like? Well, this is just a picture of it, uh, but on the left side of the screen, you can see a normal heart artery, and it's cut in half so you can see the inside of it. It's large, it's wide, it's very smooth inside, as if you were looking inside a PVC pipe. And the pink and red is the lining, and it suggests healthy tissue there. On the right side of the screen, you can see a depiction of a diseased heart artery. The arrows and the squiggles are wavy there to depict that the blood flow is not smooth through that vessel, and that thickening and narrowing is due to cholesterol plaque building up. In the picture of the heart itself, you can see that narrowing has left the heart uh, becoming weak uh, in the apex of it. So this is what we're looking for, this coronary artery disease uh, with the procedure that we're we'll talk about. So before we get to the procedure, I just want to reflect on the mainstays of treatment for heart disease. And really the biggest mainstay is modifying your underlying risk factors. So we talked about diet today and we talked about exercise. Uh, but if you have these diagnoses like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, treating those aggressively up front before developing plaque in the heart arteries is going to be very important. So you can have these three diseases, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you will develop coronary artery disease, especially if you tackle it way ahead of time. Uh, and then smoking. Stopping smoking completely is critical to preventing heart artery disease. I have patients that tell me, hey doc, I smoke a pack a day. If I cut down to a half, will that help? Well, it's better than a pack a day, but I want them to stop smoking completely. And then finally, exercise, eating healthy, and weight loss is going to be a, a mainstay to preventing this. So who needs an angiogram? You may have seen your cardiologist and they say, you know, I think we need to get an angiogram. Well, what kind of patients require or may need an angiogram? Well, if you have chest pain or abnormal stress tests, that's when they have you run on the treadmill and they take pictures of your heart to see if the blood flow is abnormal. If you have a dangerous or abnormal heart rhythm called ventricular tachycardia, you may be recommended getting an angiogram. If you have a heart attack coming in the hospital with chest pain uh, and there's injury to the heart muscle, uh, they may ask you, hey, we should get an angiogram for, uh, for you. Other things like heart valve problems or just prior to getting a valve replaced or prior to heart surgery. And then because we've been talking about heart failure, if you have heart failure or a cardiomyopathy, which are similar words, uh, they mean the same thing. Uh, they may, your doc may say, hey, we should get an angiogram to see uh, what's going on. So why does heart failure and heart, the plumbing of the heart relate to each other? So if you think of the heart as an engine, and I'll give you a little analogy here. So on the right side, you have a Toyota engine here. The gas tank provides fuel to the engine so the engine can perform appropriately. Just like the heart in the body, the heart is the engine of the body. It's pumping blood throughout all the vessels to your brain, to your kidney, to your liver uh, to help it function. If in your truck the fuel lines were clogged, your engine would not work well. And same thing in the heart, the coronary arteries are the fuel lines of the heart supplying oxygen to it. And if those are clogged, you can imagine the heart is not going to function well or you might get symptoms from it like chest pain. So that's how this works. So what is a, now we're at to the crux of the talk here. What is an angiogram? So I've shown two pictures up here. One is the room in which we work doing the angiogram, and the other one's a picture of how the angiogram works. Um, so in the room, it can be a scary place. Whenever you're getting a procedure done on you, it's always scary. 
But I want to kind of lighten you a little bit and show you what happens in the room so that if you need this procedure, you might be a little more familiar. So in the room, there's usually a nurse, uh, the heart doctor like myself, performing the angiogram, and someone assisting me uh, performing it as well. You're on a narrow table, and you'd be lying with your feet facing the bottom of the picture and your head facing the top of the picture. And it's a sterile procedure, meaning it's a clean procedure to prevent any bacteria from being introduced in the heart or in the body. That white uh, top portion is called an x-ray camera, and there's a, two TVs there to help us see where we're going. So the room is pretty simple. There's no super fancy equipment. Uh, it's just uh, four people watching you and monitoring you uh, and performing this procedure in a clean way. So how do we do it? So on the right side of the screen, you can see that uh, circle on the bottom right. It says catheter entrance. So we make a little hole uh, and place a catheter there, which is a small plastic tube, about the two millimeters in diameter, which is like four hairs lined up next to each other. And that through that tube, we look at it under x-ray and take it all the way up to the heart and inject contrast dye. Once we do that, we get images of what you see there on the right side, pictures of the heart arteries. And I'll show you what a normal artery looks like here on the next screen. Before I get to the pictures that we take, sometimes instead of going through the groin, we'll go through the wrist. And the wrist is a preferable spot because there could be potentially less bleeding uh, and less other uh, complications. But as you can see in the left screen, there is a small plastic tube inserted in a puka in the wrist. That's how big it is, very small. And through that, we'll pass our catheters up to the heart. And once we're all done, we'll take that little catheter out and place a, a, a wrist watch or a, a, a band around the wrist uh, that inflates and holds pressure there to prevent any bleeding. So this is what we see when we take those pictures. On the left side of the screen, you can see there are three labels called the left main, the LAD, and LCX. And what that means is those are the medical terms for the three major arteries on the left side of your heart. Um, as you can see in this situation, or this picture, the arteries are really wide, they're fat, and there's no narrowing in it. And there's a few branches coming off of each one. On the right-sided picture, that's the RCA, that's the right-sided artery. And same thing with that, it's a very large artery, it's wide, and there's no narrowing throughout it at all. That's what a normal angiogram should look like. So maybe 20 years ago when you're 20s, your arteries could be nice and clean like this. Now, if you develop coronary artery disease and we take a picture of your heart, you may have blockages or cholesterol plaque buildup. And this is what a coronary angiogram of cholesterol plaque buildup looks like. So on the left side of the screen, you have that main trunk artery and the two major branches. And you can see the arrows where it's labeled the LAD and CX. Before each of those labels, you can see a wide portion and then a narrow portion and then a wide portion again. Well, that narrow portion is missing the contrast dye, and that's where the cholesterol plaque has narrowed the artery. On the left side, that's about 70 to 80% blockage. On the right screen, that's that RCA artery we talked about. And the same thing, instead of being nice and smooth throughout, it's lumpy bumpy, uh, and there's a pinch in the artery suggesting cholesterol plaque buildup. So how do we treat this plaque? Well, aside from the medications that you will be prescribed and also the diet and lifestyle changes that you've done, if those aren't enough and you've now developed blockages that are significant, we may be able to treat them with a coronary stent. And a coronary stent is a small metal scaffold that looks like a spring on a pen, and it ranges in size from 2 millimeters in diameter up to 5 millimeters in diameter. And you can see that's a picture of a finger there, and on there there are two coronary stents that are inflated and those are about the size of what we put in your heart arteries if we need to. The right side of the screen is actually how the process works. So using a balloon and a wire, the stent is brought to the blockage, and then that balloon is inflated, crushing the cholesterol plaque against the wall of the artery. Once the balloon is deflated, that stent remains in place, and everything is taken out, and we put that little bandage, that uh, patch on, that watch on, to finish up. 
So people ask me, well, did you clean out the cholesterol plaque? We don't actually clean it out. We just crush it against the wall, the side of the, the artery. There's really nothing that can clean out that cholesterol plaque once it's there. In some situations, if you have lots of blockages or if you have diabetes, heart stents or coronary stents may not be the answer, and you may need heart surgery to fix this. And that's also called bypass surgery or cabbage. So in heart surgery, it's the same thing. They don't clean out the arteries that are already blocked, but they have to bypass them or make a detour. They sometimes use an artery within the chest wall and bypass the LAD, as you can see on the right-sided picture. And sometimes they take a vein from the leg and bypass the other vessels that need, bypass, that need treating. And that's attached to one end to the aorta and one end to the artery itself. So instead of cleaning it out, uh, we have to make a detour around the blockages to restore the blood flow to the heart. Patients ask me, hey doc, if I need heart surgery, what should I do? Well, if you need heart surgery, it's likely stents are not gonna be an optimal treatment. And so if you need heart surgery and it's recommended, that's something you should really consider and take that advice. So after being diagnosed with coronary artery disease, what are some, and you, if you receive a stent or heart surgery, what are some must needed medications? So aspirin is a very common medicine that almost 90% of my patients are on that have heart disease. In addition, you might be on a super aspirin called Plavix, Effient, or Berlenta. That's to keep those stents and bypass grafts open and prevent them from clotting off. Other medications like beta blockers you've heard of earlier, or a cholesterol reducer called a statin, those will help maintain the longevity of those bypass grafts as well as those stents. Um, I tell my patients if they've been diagnosed with a heart attack or heart disease coming in the hospital, they're going to leave on at least five new medicines to keep those stents open, the bypass grafts open, and to treat their heart, uh, their heart failure potentially, as well as reduce their cholesterol. So these are things you want to prevent from getting by what we call the hard part, which is lifestyle changes. Anyone can take medicines. It's very easy to you just pop a pill and you expect it to work. Sometimes you forget here and there, but really the hard part is those dietary changes and exercise. Even for me, I love to have sweets, I love to eat out, but I have to make sure I'm doing my part and exercising at least three times a week, 30 minutes a day, so that I can prevent any buildup of cholesterol plaque and keep my heart as healthy as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Lots of questions answered there for those of us who have had family members with this procedure or there may be a procedure in our future. Thank you very much. I have some questions here, and I am going to ask um, our panel of uh, presenters, whoever is the most uh, appropriate, please uh, let me know. The first question is, are ablations done here at Maui? Dr. Poon? Could I please ask you to address this one? At the moment, ablations are only done on Oahu. Uh, we, you really need to have a successful electrophysiology ablation program. You have to really have very high volumes, and that can really only be achieved on Oahu. So at the moment, it's not being done here on Maui. Thank you, Dr. Poon. Our next question, do you have any tips on how to care for someone with heart failure also, what happens if they miss a dose of their medications, which is a great question. Dr. Parikh? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, if you're, if you're taking care of a loved one who has heart failure, um, I'll just bring you back to the key points that I mentioned where um, managing medications, so keeping track of them, uh, keeping track of weights and their symptoms are probably the most useful thing you can do. Um, I can't think that there's a whole lot else that would be that helpful for us to know, uh, maybe blood pressures and heart rates, uh, but really those three things are the fundamental basis of managing this condition. Thank you. Our next question is, are there any over-the-counter vitamins you can take for heart health? If someone can address that for us. Nicole? 
Yes, we get this question a lot. Uh, you know, in terms of over-the-counter products, most of them are not really regulated, and so we don't know necessarily the safety or efficacy, meaning how well they work, of these products. Uh, in most cases, you know, it, it's not a bad idea if you want to try something to just run it by your provider and say, hey, what do you think of this? Because there may be some that interact with medications, or we may say we don't know if it interacts with your medications and it's not worth it. Uh, in most cases, if you are eating a well-balanced diet, you probably don't need extra vitamins or minerals. Um, you're probably fine just with your dietary intake. So I would say, generally speaking, you don't need to add over the counters. If you want to try something or you're interested, you should talk to your provider before you do so. Thank you, Nicole. That is our questions for this time. And if you think of questions after the fact as you're talking with others about the presentation today, please submit your questions to uh, this website. We'd be happy to address them at an, a later time. But until next year, uh, Maui Health and our guests would like to thank all of you for joining us today in this virtual presentation to Reclaim Your Rhythm at our Hawaii, our Heart Failure Community Fair. A special thank you to our speakers, each of you. Thank you so very much for helping us more aware and to help us have healthier hearts. Mahalo.